so um, reflections this evening uh, I always used to notice when uh, with Lung Cha that when he uh, you know we'd be requested to give a day and then he'd go into the high seat the tamat and then uh, he was usually very kind of uh, radiant uh, uh, kind of charismatic appearance but when he sat up on the tamat he just seemed to go empty and he uh, I noticed that like just uh, kind of a vacant look which baffled me because uh, I didn't quite understand at that time what, what he was doing but he said and then then from this vacant place would come a, a desana or a reflection and he, when he asked me to start giving talks in, in Thai uh, of course I was uh, I wasn't that confident in speaking uh, that language at all but he just said just uh, you know you've been practicing for several years uh, you know tell them what you've learned <laughs> and so and then uh, one time I prepared a talk I thought you know he said not to prepare anything just let it come naturally so uh, one one time I got really interested. I read this book by Lama Govinda, uh, Mis Tibetan mysticism, and I got very inspired by it. And so I, in one of these all-night sittings at Pudindang, I gave this incredibly intelligent, well-constructed talk. And as soon as I got down from the tamat, he said, "Don't ever do that again." <laughs> Another kind of character is one, you know, like, you know, I'm a person that that likes to plan things out, and and uh, this is how I was educated to to you know prepare and and come from uh, some kind of theme or or whatever that I think is appropriate, and and then speak from that theme. But with Lung Po Cha, it was it was more interested in speaking from the empty mind from the from the from the here and now and of course that is uh, easy enough to say but how do you do it because we we always see ourselves in a, in these very fixed terms of personality and uh, you know our identities with our appearance with our bodies and and our uh, memories and tendencies and attitudes and so forth so this is uh, this of course is the greatest obstruction uh, to understanding Dhamma is this Sakya Ditti and Sakya Ditti in the, in the ten fetters uh, the Sanyojanas in Pali are you know the first three uh, I have been emphasizing a lot because I see how important it is uh, to recognize the first three fetters which completely blind us to the path of liberation as long as our practice is motivated influenced and propelled by Sakyaditi Silabhata Bharamasa Vichikicha then you know we can spend years meditating and going on retreats and and going off and living alone and doing all kinds of things but if we don't break through the illusions of those first three fetters then with all good intentions uh, and and uh, determination we won't see the path in other words so then the <coughs> And this is very clearly spelled out in the scriptures. The first three fetters are the hindrances or the obstructions to stream entry. And then stream entry is that point where we actually know the path 
you know, through direct recognition rather than through views about it or ideas or even thinking about it. It's not a thought, not a concept, not a perception, it's an insight. And so because of this, then I I used to, the Sakya Ditti, take that one because that's the first one, translated it like the this, this self-view, the ego, uh, the identities we have with, uh, with our five khandhas and how we see ourselves is programmed into us. So we, we have these, you know, we're not born with Sakya Ditti. It's not a kind of condition uh, that it just naturally appears at birth. It's instilled in us after we're born. So we, we get an idea of ourselves in relationship to our mother and father, um, brothers, sisters, and society, culture, <clears throat> and so that's the conditioning process like the uh, vijnana taught is is uh, natural it's not a cultural condition it's not sakyaditi the human bodies we have they're natural conditions and they were born according to the laws of nature and then they grow and get old and die according to the laws of nature. And then the uh, Vedana also is, uh, you know, is natural to this realm. We live in a sensitive form uh, with, you know, the whole body is a, is a sense organ, plus the eyes, ears, nose, and tongue. And then we also have this um, ability to, uh, we have a, a retentive memory we retain things, we remember. So we can be easily conditioned and influenced by, first of all, our parents or uh, peers when we're growing up and the situation we're born into. And of course the values and sense of self-worth and identity comes from that, from you know how, we, how we're conditioned in those early years to see ourselves in relationship to the world around us from, uh, you know, an innocent uh, child's mind. But uh, the Sakya Ditti is, you know, is, is instilled in us in the early years. And the Sita Pataparamasa is, is like cultural conventions, conditioning, social attitudes, um, our particular identities that we uh, and information we get just being born in the various ethnic group or national group or racial the gender and all these are not necessarily sakya ditti but are instilled in us through that conditioning process and then which is a result is a is doubt which means uh, is a result of always attachment to thought. As long as we attach to our thinking process, we're never quite sure. We we always end up with doubt as the result. Now these are to be investigated. I mean, you just can't suddenly dismiss them or get rid of them. But you know, they're there. They're, they're, I, I've found this formula ten better is very useful because it, it it states something that you can reflect on. How do how do you create yourself as a person? How do you create Sakyaditi? If it's not coming from outside, it's not David Oz or or influences from outside, it's not anything but it's how we you know, the very thoughts we have the language, the memories, the identities, uh, the sense of me and mine. Um, I am, you are, it goes into the, all the, the personal pronouns and the, and the identity, the sense of mine, this is my Sankati, this is, <laughs> this is my Chiwan. And of course on a conventional level, fair enough, but this sense of me and mine and I am 
and then you and we uh, and they, all these come from a conditioning process and whatever your native language is, you, 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 that's the one that you, you're conditioned by in the early years. So thinking, you know, when you think we, we have to use language, so we, we uh, cling to thoughts and memories, values, principles, attitudes, uh, conventions, as well as emotional memories, uh, fear, hatred, delusion, jealousy. We identify with all these. We identify with, with our sexual drive. We identify with our moods and feelings. In other words, this identity is like a clinging to these conventions, to these uh, uh, conditions. And it's done out of ignorance. It's not that we do it, you know, with full knowledge and wisdom. It's out of ignorance that that we become conditioned and blinded and limited by the very conditions that that we are attached to and identify with. So just contemplate, you know, reflect on the power of your language, or just just the the pronoun I I am. I used to contemplate that in my mind. It's like it's it's a fair enough statement because it's a statement of presence. It's not, you know, when I just think the the personal pronoun I am, I'm, I'm announcing a state of being present, but it's still not a person yet, is it? It's just a a, a statement of presence. <clears throat> And then I add the personal bits. I am Ajahn Tomato, I am American, I am a bhikkhu, and on and like that. And I'm a good bhikkhu, I'm not a very good bhikkhu, I'm senior bhikkhu, or whatever. And the whole thing, then you form this sense of yourself. Uh, but this, this I am is also a conditioning. Uh, that we acquire, and then, uh, then my thoughts, my views, my opinions, my life, my rights, what I think, uh, this is mine, it belongs to me, and so we create a whole world around this illusion of a separate self, and, and this identity with I am, me and mine. Now, I'm not expecting you to believe this, but what encouragement here is to investigate. Because it's something you can, you can actually investigate in, in consciousness, like at this moment. All you have to do is think, I am. And that's, you know, there's an awareness of this in deliberate thinking, these two words. So, I am is not a kind of fixed position or a permanent state, it's merely a convention of language that can be observed. But attachment to thought always takes us into, I am Ajahn Sumato and I'm good, bad, right, wrong, and on and on like that. And then, then I create a whole sense of myself uh, according to values of good and bad, right and wrong, according to memories according to ideas of what should be, according to memories of maybe things I've done that I shouldn't have done, things I've done in the past that I feel guilty about. The whole sense of a self arises from this attachment to the thinking process. So then uh, to stop thinking, I mean we're usually so condition to think. We're, we're called uh, manusia or creatures that think that have <laughs> we have and it is it can be a curse and it's also a blessing. It's how to use our thinking abilities uh, through wisdom that the Buddha, uh, his teachings are about learning to think in the right way, learning to use thought 
in a skillful way rather than just be conditioned to think like a Buddhist or think like uh, the scriptures or think according to a, a conditioning process that comes out of avicca or ignorance. So this word avicca is very important because it means not knowing Dhamma, not recognizing reality. It's not about not being able to read and write or ignorance of all kinds of things, but it, this avicca means not being awake and operating from a program that you acquired uh, and and not being able to see what you're doing, what you're grasping. So then, of course, uh, that leads to suffering and uh, and that's what we experience in our lives, is suffering. So, you know, I've, because we are obsessed thinkers, then we tend to try to think ourselves out of, through the Dhamma and how to think about Nibbana or think about Anatta or think about the path or think about, uh, you know, the uh, Dhamma as something we've got to define, something we, we've got to identify through perception. So the Buddha, recognizing the, the dilemmas that human beings have, you know, used the, the actual uh, reality of suffering as a noble truth uh, because it's something easily seen. It's not esoteric or arcane or remote or special. I mean, we all suffer in, in all kinds of ways uh, because of this ignorance. This ignorance is the cause of all suffering. So in the Paticca Samupada, Paticca Samupada, you know, it starts out with Avicca, Bhajaya, Sankara, and then it ends with, and it all ends up with Soka Paritewa, Tukka Tomra Nupaya, grief, sorrow, despair, and anguish. So if, if every thought, every movement, everything you do, starts with a vicha, the result is always going to be dukkha, is the result of a vicha influences vicha vajaya sankara. In other words, this a vicha influences your thoughts and how you see uh, yourself, your memories. Sankara vajaya vinyana, consciousness, vinyana nama rupa. Salayatana, Pasa Vedana, and so forth, down to Soka Paritewat, and it's the, the grief, sorrow, despair, and anguish, or suffering. So the aim is to <clears throat> awaken to Dhamma, and, and so we're not operating from Avicca anymore. We can still operate from Avicca, even though we're Buddhist monks, you know, so we we are always trying to become things, trying to get things we don't have, trying to get rid of things we have that we don't want. Uh, and so our attempts, uh, eager attempts to practice, uh, can be uh, motivated by avicca. And of course, that's always going to end up in some kind of grief or despair or disappointment. So the important, uh, this is how I see it, is, is to get through this, to, to not operate from a vicha, but from the present moment, from the empty, from consciousness that is no longer uh, limited by ignorance and attachment to sankharas or conditions. And of course, that is the uh, sati sampachanya sati panya. So this, uh, and my own insights into this is that this is the only possible escape hatch we have in this realm is through sati sampachanya. There's no other way. You can't get it through refining consciousness, and you know, through the conditions, through the jhanas, through refining 
uh, conditioned phenomena, uh, you know, as long as there's conditioned phenomena and you still cling to it out of ignorance, no matter how beautiful or refined it might be, it's still, you still have the basic problem is the avicca, not understanding, not seeing Dhamma. So in this uh, Thai forest tradition, the, the, the uh, mantra puto is, I found very helpful because it's uh, the Buddha's name and uh, it can be used as, to tranquilize the mind. You know, it's a good practice of samatha to, to just uh, stop the, the uh, wandering mind. Uh, through thinking, the, through just the internalizing puto puto as as a, as a word, just to stop the wandering in thought, the the proliferating thought tendencies and habits that we have. Uh, like Lung Po Cha, when he said, he told me in the beginning, he said, if if you're going to think, think puto. He said, don't think about anything else. And of course, I'm a, you know I'm a person that likes to think and and um, would like to figure everything out with thought, um, but with all the best attempts, still uh, even if you figure it all out with thought, you still suffer because the vicha is still there. So it's 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 a it's a kind of imminent reality of awakened attention in the present. It's merely the ability we have to pay attention, to be attentive, to be awake, to be open, receptive in the present. So, at this present moment when we're sitting here, then we have, you know, we can focus on an object like samatha. Uh, meditations are always focusing on, us, on, on an object. We limit ourselves to one object and focus on that, and that's like fixing your attention on a point, concentrating on one point, uh, an object, in order to uh, shut out everything else. So it's a it's a kind of samatha practice, concentration practice, and you have to get rid of, you have to ignore, dismiss, repress everything else, in order to just absorb and and concentrate on the one point. Then there's, then there's uh, Sati Sampatanya, which is, is uh, the, kind of this broad, open perspective in the present moment. So I, I like to I use these words like the point that excludes and the point that includes. Because a point doesn't have to, that's, that's really, doesn't necessarily have to be a dot. It can, be the whole thing at this moment. This, this, the point. The point that includes means that, that that we're allowing everything to be what it is like in the present. It is the way it is. You know that includes the village noises, the gunshots, the music, <laughs> the heat, uh, all the monks, and everything else is. Everything at this moment belongs here because it's here. You know, so this is the point of including. And, and so th this is for reflection, you know, do we have to exclude the world in order to escape it? Or is the real path not excluding the world but including? Inclusive, so this is a, like a, a conundrum. I know from my own experiments that that practicing in order to get rid of the world, to suppress it, to to uh, control my conscious experience on one point, has you know it's had certain advantages, but it, it's not an escape hatch. It's just a temporary. Uh, state that, uh, you know, you can't sustain for that long. But the point that includes then is always, 
including everything, wherever you are, whatever state your mind, your body is in, in the conditions you find yourself in. So that's, uh, this is the, the kind of Vipassana style of Sama, uh, Sama Samadhi, where you, you're, it's an inclusive, there is Sama Vayamo, Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi. Now I used to, because I figured this out before I actually could do it, I used to practice a lot just trying to open up to the present moment. And so I'd use things like just be here and now and say things like the way it is. But also it's it's a kind of relaxed state. It's not a rigid, intense, forced sense of concentration. In order to include everything at this moment, it's it's a kind of relaxed attention. It's not a dull kind of, you just include everything and fall asleep, but you, you're you attentive, but you're not forcing, you're not forcing the mind to concentrate on one object. So everything that's happening in this moment that we're experiencing, they belongs here. And I found this very helpful living in situations where you have very little control over the conditions around you. If you're living in Bangkok or London or places like that, you know, how, how can you demand, you know, the, the London shut up and be quiet so I can do my samatha practice? Or even in uh, forests in Thailand or even in England, you know, there's, there's always something uh, to disrupt or uh, annoy or irritate. Unless you get, uh, you know, a, a sensory deprivation tank or a completely black, dark cave. But then you're, you're making conditions for your practice. You have to have special conditions that control so you, you are not irritated by any external, harsh and external impingement. But even in a dark cave, you know, where there's nothing, no sound coming in and no light, you still, your mind goes on. You know, your, your consciousness, and all the, I found uh, the first three months of my meditation in Nongkai, when I was a Samanera, uh, was, you know, I was all alone in a kuti. I didn't talk to anyone. I bring the food, but, I was, you know, I tried to practice samatha meditation, trying to control consciousness. But when you're all alone 24 hours a day uh, with yourself and nothing to do, uh, and, but just try to repress everything, you, you know, you can only do that so long and then you, you can't do it anymore. So it's a matter of, of opening up to the present conditions as they happen to arise. Well, I found that uh, much, I was 30, 30 years old, 31 years old, and, and I'm from a, a social background that was very repressive. <clears throat> so you were never allowed to show anger and things. So we, you learn how to suppress you know, I was clever enough to where I learned how to suppress feelings uh, because that was what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to show anger towards your mother or father or uh, you're supposed to, you know, you have these ideas of what good boys should be and respecting their parents. And in order to perform that role, then a lot of things had to be reduced and repressed. Uh, and these started coming up. In, uh, in those uh, first three months, uh, anger, resentment, states of mind that uh, I had never really recognized before. I used to have this opinion you know, before I ordained that I was a fairly 
nice guy, really, kind of, you know, good-natured, uh, kind kind of person. And uh, then being alone with myself, I found some of the thoughts, uh, emotions that would arose were shocking to me. Because I thought that old image of myself as being a good guy, it's not true. <laughs> Only a bad guy could be thinking like this. But somehow or other, the situation and the trust in Dhamma, I already had a lot of faith in Dhamma, so I stayed with it. And eventually, these kind of dark things manifested, came up, and then I just let them go. I couldn't control them, I didn't suppress them. They were, it's like a purifying, purifying experience rather than driving me crazy uh, and making me you know disrobe actually it was like uh, like purifying like an, a mental enema what comes out is is rather disgusting but it's also purifying the, the mind and then after three months I woke up one morning and the mind was absolutely luminous. There was no, you know, I was, uh, I couldn't, all these, these dark things were gone. So I was in a state of, like, sopanajita, kind of state of, of uh, consciousness that was uh, luminous and beautiful. But Avicca was still there, so I, uh, I immediately thought, you know, I'm enlightened. Three months, I'm enlightened. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's Avicca. <laughs> and I'm going to find out later that I wasn't. But it, it was a, a, you know, a, a unique experience. Because I never had that experience before, where where your mind, you know, your consciousness is still operating, you know, you're alert, you're not in a trance. But there's no sense of a self. It's very light and buoyant feeling. Everything was touched by luminosity. So I was in this kuti, uh, not, you know, it's a pretty rough kind of kuti, anything but beautiful. But it looked beautiful with this mind like this. Everything was was beautiful. The the Hong Nam, the toilet was beautiful. <laughs> and then I realized it's the mind that's beautiful. You know, it's it's that that, that it's a, a purity of consciousness is beautiful. It has luminosity, it's radiant. But a vicha, when that is the cause, when we start with a vicha, then we don't know that. We always, a vicha bhajaya sankara sankara bhajaya vinyana. So then our consciousness is always is, is being affected and conditioned by a vicha. So, Anyway, the encouragement is to investigate these three fetters, not from a personal perspective, like I'm investigating three fetters, but deliberately create yourself, but listen to it. Like, like you know, if you're just trying to, to suppress self-views and, and sakya ditti, it doesn't work another kind of Sakya It just becomes more confused and complicated. So the self needs to be recognized. And this was my insight, was that to create Sakya I have to think and I have to attach to these thoughts. Believe in what I'm thinking. Believe the thoughts I have. Uh, unquestionably operate from Sakya Ditti or Avicca. And then that then that always ends up as never being quite sure where I am, what I've done, if I'm right or wrong, <clears throat> whether I'm getting anywhere or not, or if I'm doing it right, or, you know, so there's always this sense of 
doubt as a result of avicca, which is another form of dukkha, for suffering. Because in this kind of doubting state that's caused through avicca, through grasping our thinking process, our views and opinions. Test it out, just see, you know, notice also that that just I am is before you even think the word I, you just notice in when you're determined to think, you know, I just say these two words. Before you think I, there's a kind of empty space. You know, a pause, isn't it? And you kind of note that, that empty pre-state before you think, intentionally think I, is like this. Uh, and so you're beginning to notice before you think I, the, the space before that, that word, and then think I, and then there's another gap. So. I used to practice really uh, noting these gaps between words, or in uh, you know just in uh, I did a lot of meditation on space, visual space, because when when I was at Wapapong years ago, you know I started forming views and opinions about different monks. So you know I, as I got to know them monks and I had my own views about it. this is a good monk, this isn't such a good monk. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I thought, you know, that I sit, sit with these monks every day, every morning, every evening, in the morning, evening chanting, and I still see them in terms of Sakyadidi personalities and my own particular judgments of them. So I started just practicing awareness around the space between monks. I wouldn't pay attention to the individual monks, you know, the, this monk or that monk, but the space between. It's there, you know, you just have to look. And, and just changing from this habitual sense of um, me making value judgments about others and liking or disliking others, uh, and creating these, you know, I'm creating personalities in my mind about these monks. So the space is pretty much, you know, between one monk and the next is, is, has nothing but space. It has no quality to it. It's not Ajahn this or whatever, you know, it's not, it has, it's not a bhikkhu, it's not a samanera. So it just be, beginning to notice. So you're you're consciously determining uh, gaps and spaces. This works on the visual level, but then on a mental level, you know, with with the thinking process, this recognition of the before gap when you before I, and then there's a gap, and then am, and then is a space. But then we tend to fill it up. I am Arjun Samedo, I've done this, I've done that. And we go on in proliferating about uh, my history, and my all the things I've done or haven't done, <laughs> my views and opinions. And that's, that's creation out of ignorance. That Arjun Samedo is that proliferating habit is, is created by Avicca. And it always ends up as dukkha. Now the other part of Paticca Samupada is uh, what? Patiloma? The Niroda five. So these these apply to the to the second and third noble truths. You know, like you in order to investigate the second noble truth it's the Anuloma, where you, you start with the Vicha Bhajya Sankara. And then it, it reads, you know, it ends up with Soka Parite with Tuka Tomanadu Payan. And then the Neroda side is where the Vichas gone. So everything ceases 
when there's no vicha, the whole thing collapses, and that's nirodha. And and by and that's observable. I mean, it's recognizable, nirodha. <clears throat> so you don't kind of drop dead or you know go unconscious, but there's still consciousness operating. There's mindfulness, but there's also discernment of non-attachment, uh, non a uh, where a not a bicha means ignorance. Bicha means knowing, knowledge, insight. So these, um, I found all these teachings so helpful because uh, they're really brilliant. You know, they got four noble truths. But teach us samupada. You've got the ten fetters, the four stages. You know, like stream entry is is that insight where there is that moment where there's no sakyaditi sila bhattabharama sevichikicca. There's no avicca. So it's a recognized. You recognize the path, and all the personal. <laughs> you know, you don't create, you know, when the, the following ones, like Sakadakami, Anakami, Anahat, these are, you know, like uh, Sakadakami, you still have uh, lust and, and anger or aversion. But these are natural conditions. These are not, you know, the sexual desire and anger are a primal kind of they come with the package they're not they're not about culture or personality anymore or language they're they're energies survival mechanisms they're for pro, like sexual desires for procreating the species and anger and fear are kind of are kind of primal uh, survival mechanisms that all animals have you know so then but with Sakya Ditti, Silapata Paramasa, Vijikicha, we make these very personal all the time. My sexual desires, my anger, my fears, everything becomes personalized and then it and then it's a vija and then it always leads to suffering. So the important issue is to see through these created human created conditions. You know, not not to not not to, to get rid of them, but to understand. So you're no longer coming from a vicha. You can still think I am, you know, and uh, use language and and operate from uh, social conventions and so forth. But the difference lies that there's uh, there's vicha rather than a vicha. So Ajahn Chah was was always emphasizing samut satcha, baramatta satcha. Samut is the is the conventional realities that we have to use, you know, in in society and in the world we live in. And then Baramantra Sancha is ultimate reality. Now the great thing is that we can actually recognize ultimate reality as these human individuals. If not, if not, kind of beyond our abilities and, the, and but it's it's clearly uh, stated clearly spelled out in these Pali teachings in the suttas they couldn't you know I'm, after 46 panzas I'm still you know, absolutely uh, totally impressed with the Buddha's wisdom because uh, these teachings are incredibly practical they're not just high-minded, idealized, uh, uh, you know, philosophies. Uh, uh, or they're not, they're not, you know, based on something that is so remote, so refined that we can never possibly do it. It's based on just the reality of here and now and human suffering and how to use that suffering in order to be free from attachment to it. And this realm that we actually live in is a realm of suffering. It's about death. 
we're all going to die and we all have to lose the, our loved ones all that is mine, beloved and pleasing will become otherwise will become separated from me you know, many people don't like that reflection all that is mine, beloved and pleasing will be mine forever and ever and will never be separated from me <laughs> is I think the Western mindset <laughs> make me live forever and all that is mine, beloved and pleasing will be mine forever but this is a reflective teaching isn't it all that is mine, beloved and pleasing will become otherwise it's just pointing at the reality of change and this realm so that we awaken to the way things are not try to create uh, an illusory uh, heavenly realm that can only end up in suffering anyway because it will be terribly disappointed because reality is not like that it's not heaven it's like this and this reality then isn't the, isn't just the sankaras changing but it includes the awareness of change the deathless or the the uh, amata dhamma so our refuge then is in amata dhamma or deathless reality rather than in in just kind of a resignation to old age sickness and death in some kind of uh, negative way so anyway I'll stop here I get going I get very enthusiastic about this <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing that I find interesting in these days because it, it is but you know you, you, it's, you can prove it you know it's not just you know high minded thinking or you know living in a in, you know, in cloud nine, it's, it's it deals with the realities of of my own aging body and uh, experience that I'm involved in. And then, uh, you know, like in the West, <coughs> people have very strong opinions. Uh, about everything and so you know we're very we're, we're, we're supposed to have opinions about things we may know nothing about at least my generation was remember in university you know I felt I had to have opinion about everything even though I didn't know most of the things they were talking about but I could have an opinion so that, that's a, a very strong sense of self, having to have a, a, a point of view, having or having to be right. You know, always having, fe feeling I might be wrong, or always having to be right. My view is the right, my attitude is the right attitude, my way is the right way. So it, this is, you know, can be put in this category of Sakya Ditti. And, and then it's not to be despised, but to be recognized. It's, it's listening to now, you know, like in in, uh, in, in the West, they, they have such high-minded uh, ideas. They, they attach to very high uh, concepts. So it's like freedom, democracy, equality. Uh, you know, all these things are very inspiring as ideals how things should be we should all love each other and be kind and we should all support each other in the Dhamma and we should never hurt or harm or hate or insult each other we should always have metta for all creatures and we should <laughs> and these are these are very high minded ideals but the way it is it's not about becoming uh, high minded but awaken to the reality of being that having the karma that you have the way your mind works you know the, your body your feelings your emotions 
are like this. It's not justifying or uh, anything, it's really recognizing sankaras as impermanent. And, and we all have to learn from the way we are. You can't learn like, you know, you, I can't be Ajahn Cha or Lumpur Liam or anything like that. I've got to learn from this thing here. And it's not that I always, you know, I'm very self-critical as a Sakyaditi personality. I'd like to, you know, been more like Lung Po Cha, actually. <laughs> but uh, that wasn't the karma I had to live with. I was like this, you know, in whatever forms that takes. But this awareness, this is the escape hatch. So in uh, this, uh, in the Dimana Sutta, there's uh, this, there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. Therefore, there is an escape from the born, the created, the formed, the conditioned. It says so in the demand. There's an escape from the created, the formed, the born, the conditioned. Because there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. You can't conceive, like these words, unborn, uncreated, you can't conceive anything, can you? My mind goes blank. Try to conceive unborn, uncreated with your thinking mind. All you can do is negate created. All you can say is uncreated. But you can't form a picture, an image. It has no color. So it, it's not about conditioned phenomena. That all, Conditioned phenomena always has shape, form, size, texture, color, has some form of shape, has some quality like smell, taste, or touch. But unborn, uncreated, and that, that's like a koan, it stops the thinking mind. You can't, you can't think anymore. Like Lung Po Cha used to say, trying to solve the, think about anatta will your head will explode trying to analyze and figure out anatta no self because this the thinking mind is born out of a vicha and it's and it depends on on that on a sense of me and mine and 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 form and uh, being blinded by the form, being identified with form, nama rupa, salayatana, pasavedana, dana, upatam. And then it goes into tati, jaramarana, sokaparitewa, tukatomara upayan. Well, this is like learning to, to really test your mind out. You know, the, the created, the, there is the born, the, the created, the born, the form, the condition. You can create anything with that. You can create any, like, abstract forms, or you can make uh, definite forms of microphones and men and women and so forth. They all have their def defined forms. You can make fantasy forms, colors, mixed colors, and create textures, and do all kinds of things with, with the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air. With the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, the thinking mind stops. And to know that when there's no thought is like this, no, you can recognize. And it's like gum note rule in the, in, the, in the Thai term to really notice this because it happens all the time but we never notice it because we're always going from one thing to the next. So, so this mindfulness then allows us to notice the gaps in space between monks. Uh, notice the space between this row and the next row. It's just, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but it's actually, you're actually informing consciousness 
with this kind of knowledge, space, is here and now. It doesn't have any quality other than being spacious. And it's, it doesn't have any personality, it doesn't belong. It's not mine or yours. And then, uh, in consciousness, is one of the unlimited things. So, it, it, you know, when you're conscious, then, then you, with sati and sampachanya, you can actually observe form uh, arise and cease, conditions arise and cease. And then you notice the presence and the absence of conditions in consciousness. This is, a, this is an example of, that, uh, example of I am. Sounds too simple, doesn't it? But uh, you've got to start out from something kind of basic. So I create I and am, and between those two words is a space, and before and after. And so you, you're actually informing. You, you, if you do this, then your mindfulness will connect. You know, rather than, rather than just kind of sporadic flashes of insight. Your, your, you know, you can, your mindfulness can sustain itself because it's natural. Mindfulness is not created. We don't create mindfulness. I can't make myself be mindful as a person, but I can be mindful through letting go of conditions and 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 uh, investigating. Yoni so manasikara. So I offer this as a reflection. <laughs>